We've seen what the JavaScript ecosystem looks like without an easy to use package manager. And it wasn't as good. Like it didn't grow as quickly. There wasn't as much innovation. Like that's just not an option. So the other option was I could pay for it out of pocket. And it's like, okay, well, I don't have, you know, tens of thousands of dollars per month that I can spend on this thing. So I thought, all right, well, let's probably we could figure out a way to make money with this thing. Let's start a company and maybe the company can keep it running. And so that's what we did. Hello, welcome to the DevTools FM podcast. This is a podcast about developer tools and the people who make them. I'm Andrew, and this is my co-host, Justin. Hey, everyone. Today, we're incredibly excited to have Isaac uh, on the podcast. So you may know Isaac as the founder of NPM, uh, former uh, one of the former, like, you're the benevolent dictator for life for a little bit for Node, like back in the early, early days. It turns out for life, it's only a couple of years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A short life, a short while. Yeah. For for a little while. That's what the L stands for, apparently. Well, Isaac, we're incredibly excited and humbled to have you on. Uh, your work has touched both of us a lot. Uh, I mean, we've obviously had a lot of interactions with NPM. It's been pretty pivotal and and both of our careers so really really excited to have you on before we dig in to talk about more things is there more that you'd like to tell our listeners about yourself no no i think that that covers the the rough strokes of it anyway the rough outline we'll get into more stuff yeah absolutely sounds great yeah so before we uh move on to like what you've been working present day uh i want to touch on the past a little bit just because uh as justin said uh npm and node i don't think i'd be in my career where I am in my career without both of those things. Like the biggest uh, NPM package that I have is an automated release tool that's built on top of Semver. So lots of layers of Isaac uh, all throughout that project. Uh, so you, you have seen the Node project from the start. I just want to get a little bit of perspective of like what it was it like at the start. And like, did you guys think it was going to be this like industry defining of a thing at the start? And yeah, just how does it feel now? So at the start, uh, I, I got into Node when I actually got into server side JS before before Node was really a thing. Uh, there was a bunch of different kind of explorations and ideas and stuff being kicked around, and and mostly it was just because I was tired of having to write uh, PHP on the server and JavaScript on the client. And I was like, well, I can't. Neither of these are like particularly good languages per se, but. Um, <laughs> You know, at least, at least if I could just have one of them, that would that would maybe make my life a little easier. So I started uh, getting into server side JS. Uh, and there was a group called um, the Server JS group, which kind of became then later um, Common JS because uh, they incorporated um, folks who were working on the the um, extensions platform at Firefox. And uh, I wanted to implement a lot of the same APIs. So just kind of come up with a, a sort of a standard library was the idea that all of these different implementations could use. And the assumption was always that, you know, I mean, just culturally in JavaScript, we have many implementations and they all kind of interoperate and compete and, you know, compete for Mindshare or whatever with, with web browsers. And that is generally, I don't know, if, if not a good thing, it's at least a expected common normal thing. And uh, uh, yeah, so then um, Node came out and really kind of shook things up because there was, there was a lot of stuff in the common JS sort of discussions and specifications that they were coming up with um, that didn't really make sense in an asynchronous environment, an event-oriented environment. So, uh, you know, things like file APIs and networking APIs and stuff that sort of assume that you'd be running in a threaded context or in a fully synchronous context, um, which if you're implementing on top of the JVM or something else, that that's kind of the most sensible way to go about it. It's the most straightforward way to go about it. So Node came out and it was just the thing that really um, jumped out at me at the time was like, this feels like JavaScript. Like this doesn't feel like it's fighting the language nearly as much as a lot of other um, common JS platforms felt like. They, they felt like you were writing Java or writing C, but just with JavaScript syntax. And so, yeah, I got, I got super into Node and it became pretty clear right away that like, if if there is going to be, you know, multiple runtimes on the server-side JS world, like it's going to probably look like this. 
Uh, there have been a couple of other, um, I mean, there have been server-side JavaScript runtimes as long as there's been JavaScript almost. I mean, uh, uh, Netscape had a, uh, what was it, live server uh, thing. And, um, you know, there have been a couple of other forays. There was even a, a few, like, pass systems at the time. Um, Microsoft Active Server Pages, you could write in JScript forever. So it's it, none of it's really, like, brand new ideas, but... Uh, the thing that was interesting about Node was it was it was fully event oriented and asynchronous and felt like JavaScript without requiring that you sort of artificially constrain your program into this DOM, you know, style of object model. So like with uh, active server pages in JScript, you would have a script run at equals server, and then you'd put your JavaScript code in that. But it's like, how do you use that to write a program that like I don't know reads a JPEG file and compresses it or changes it or whatever, right? Like just does random stuff um so it wouldn't be like a replacement for you know we wanted something that would be a replacement for bash or c or Perl, like just one of these like general purpose languages that happen to also be really good for writing web servers so yeah node uh node really fit the bill and, and i kind of got into it very early on and uh back in the day when there was you know a um I think a lot of people don't like GitHub is so synonymous with pull requests now. People forget there was a GitHub before there was pull requests. Um, but most of the activity around Node in those early days all happened on a Google mailing list, which is still, you know, archived in the Google groups if you want to go research history. And for a while, I mean, there was like single digit dozens of people involved with Node and they were sharing interesting things and saying, hey, you know, I. I published this module, it does X, Y, and Z. And like, in order to install it, you have to pull the Git repo and then run make. And then it depends on this other thing. So you like have to check out the sub module and cop and, and build it as well. And then copy it into this place. And then it all just works if you load this one specific file. And it's like, I was, I was wanting to like build real things with this. So that meant, you know, pulling in a lot of people's code and, and playing around with the other things that people were, were doing. And that got really tedious. So I started, um, there was something in the common JS, um, specification group that was like the packages spec. And so I wrote sort of an implementation of that. It deviated pretty, pretty widely from it. Actually, it, it didn't really like comply with the common JS spec because it had a bunch of stuff in it that I just either didn't think was a good idea or just didn't make sense in a node context. And the main thing that I really wanted to, uh, uh, to ensure was that if you, you know, we could avoid this sort of dependency hell, dependency hell as it was known in, you know, 2010, 2009, which is different than what people mean when they say the word now, the meaning has really changed. What it meant then was like, you know, I depend on module X and X depends on module Y at some version. And then sometime later, I install module Z, which also depends on module Y, but it's a different version of module Y. I have never heard of why. I don't know why it's in my stack. I don't know what it's doing there, but it's telling me, and I, I ran into this so much when I was um, working at Yahoo, like this was just like the bane of my existence. Uh, Cause for whatever reason on every team, I ended up being like the package manager guy, like the toolsmith guy who was in charge of our build script and making sure everything ran, which was weird. Cause I was also a front end developer, but somebody had to do that job, right? And so, you know, we would update something and it'd be like, oh, uh, lib nicu SSI, it can't, you know, you can't upgrade this random PHP module because this other thing you've like never heard of, it conflicts with this different version. And I'd be like combing through the dependency graph to figure out like, what is the resolution? And just look like this is, computers should do this for me. This is terrible. So with NPM really from the beginning, I made sure that like if, if you have two different conflicting versions of something in the tree, it's fine. It'll just like load in this like sort of isolated space and each thing will get the version of all its dependencies that it says it can work with um, and everything's great. So the, what that actually did, which is really interesting, is like you, you reduce the friction by doing that. You reduce the friction to using dependencies because why not? Like... The only reason you wouldn't is that like, you know, the more dependencies you have, the harder it is to install. Well, you remove that obstacle and very quickly what we saw is modules got smaller and smaller and smaller because again, like, why not? 
who cares? It's not going to conflict. And if it does, I'll just load another one. It's no big deal. Um, and and thing the dependencies that things pull in got you know those lists got longer and longer as a result because each thing is smaller and smaller. And so instead of you know one giant kitchen sink dependency that has everything you could possibly need in it, like you see a lot in most language runtimes, right? In in Maven and in uh, Pear and in CPAN, this is pretty common. Um, we ended up in a state where we have modules like is on, which is it has a dependency on is even, which has a dependency on is number, right? <laughs> it's like I mean that's that's the absurd example, but there are less absurd examples that are still pretty absurd by comparison to most other runtimes. So um, now what people mean when they say dependency hell is I have too many dependencies, but it's like, yeah, but they all built and you didn't actually have to look at them. Like you're just complaining because it's too easy is the problem. That's you're welcome. Um, yeah. So I guess, uh, uh, yeah. So I started, Sending people pull requests to add uh, package JSON files to their to their packages and caught on pretty quickly. Um, there were a couple of other package managers that people had had sort of sketched together, and I think the main difference with npm it's not that it was better; it's that I quit my job to work on it, so it had somebody fixing the bugs. That's it. That's that was the killer feature, um, and uh, yeah, and then and then once it kind of took off, it, it ended up more or less taking on a life of its own. Um, everybody using it for everything. I wonder, like, in retrospect, looking at back at some of the early decisions and sort of how the N Node ecosystem and, and NPM itself has evolved, uh, are there things that you think now that you would have, like, made slightly different decisions at that time? Well, I mean, obviously, yeah, there, there, there definitely are. I think, uh, I, I mentioned this recently, there was this, you know, this meme going around of like, hey, senior senior devs, like, what's what's like your you know your biggest screw up that you ever pushed production? Uh, and I, <laughs> I mentioned, yeah, my worst one was uh, uh, which I pushed the production and it didn't even get noticed for about six years was um, that, and it made perfect sense at the time, right? It's like a CRUD system. If you can if you can write to it, you should be able to delete it. That just makes sense. And so you could npm unpublish a package and that was never a problem until it was suddenly a really big problem. I'm sure I'm sure most people have heard of LeftPad. Uh, what's what's kind of interesting is sometimes, like even though um, you know, very quickly we 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 closed that that hole right when that happened, and we saw what a big uh, just what a big mess that caused, um, and realized like oh this this is not like packages on npm aren't just like some randos little hack project like this is actually kind of an ecosystem and these things are interdependent if you can just yank something out of the out of the web there it, it causes a lot of hassle for a lot of people so we we made it so you can't just delete a can't delete a package um there are still some cases where you can unpublish something if it has no dependencies and it's you know when published within the last 24 hours and 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 and, and it's like I still sometimes like I'll publish something and they go, oh, whoops, I meant to do, I meant to give it a different name. I try to unpublish it. And PM's like, no, somebody wants this. I'm like, oh, I, nobody's ever heard of it. It didn't even exist five minutes ago. Um, but yeah, I, I think, uh, I think just like making N the NPM registry append only, strictly append only. If you leak a secret, too bad. It's leaked. Like it was leaked anyway, you know, because there's, there's downstream mirrors that don't, uh, don't necessarily, uh, respect deletes. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's one, one big thing I would have done differently. I think otherwise, yeah, no, uh, all, all the bad decisions were other people's. Yeah. It, it's, it's cool to hear that. Like I definitely, uh, relate with like the front end guy that just like, for some reason is kind of just doing tooling and doing, doing infra just cause you have like the experience and you've done it a lot and it just kind of like comes down up upon you. And it's also super interesting to me that like you went through all of this and got us out of the first circle of dependency hell and into the second level. <laughs> it's funny that people like wouldn't even like, like they'd probably look at the, the first dependency hell and go like, Oh, that's like, that's not that hard really. Like it's a much less problem. There's like, you're you're just trying to install a few dependencies and get them to work together. Now the problem is we're trying to install thousands and get them to work together. So we've definitely like leveled up the game a lot. Yeah, I mean at least it's at least now it's just a runtime problem though, right? Like it's just it's just your code that 
that needs to worry about it. Um, I think also in hindsight, uh, I, I did not understand at the time. I didn't fully comprehend at the time. Um, just what a massive pain peer dependencies would be. Um, peer dependencies, in case people don't, don't fully know it's, it's, it's a way to say like, I depend on this path or, or, but I, I don't, I don't use it directly, but if you're using my thing, you have to use it with this version of this other thing. So like a react component that only works with react 18 and up or something like that. It doesn't necessarily have a dependency on react. If you installed a separate different version as its depth, that wouldn't work. The whole point is it should be working with this other thing. And yeah, from a, from the point of view of like, so that can actually get you back into that first ring of dependency hell, right? If I install two things that have a conflicting peer dependency, they actually can't be installed together at the same level in the tree. It took until NPM seven that we actually had an implementation of this that actually resolves peer dependencies and the algorithm for doing it is kind of kind of required just sort of a, a ludicrous amount of work. There are some things like PubSub, like our PubGrub and some other algorithms that are that are pretty effective for at least trying to have heuristics to resolve some of these more challenging situations um, that arise in, in dependency graphs. But it is, I mean, at the end of the day, it's like, this is an NP hard problem. Like sometimes it just has to be like, I don't know, human, you figure it out. This week's episode is once again, sponsored by Raycast. Raycast is an app for Mac that's like Spotlight, but a whole lot better. Besides just doing the standards things like opening files, URLs, or apps, it can do a whole lot of really cool things with all the extensions that they provide. One extension that I've been using a lot lately is another utility that just replaces a default tool of my Mac. So I have to use my activity monitor a lot to kill processes, or sometimes I use the command line to do that. But that's a lot of clicks. So recently I downloaded Raycast's kill process extension, and now I can kill a process really quickly without really losing context or having to click through menus. All for my keyboard, really fast, right in my workflow, right where Raycast shines. But Raycast just doesn't stop there. With Raycast Pro, you have access to Raycast AI. And let me tell you, having AI at your fingertips at all times makes it so much easier to use. This workflow has spread like a disease throughout me and my coworkers. So now when I hop on a Zoom call or a Slack huddle, I'll often see my coworkers pull up their Raycast quick chat to solve a problem while we're working through something. If you want to learn more about Raycast, head over to Raycast.com. Or if you want a more in-depth look at what Raycast is and how they got to where they are, check out episode 38, where we talked to Thomas, the CEO. Do you want to advertise with DevTools FM? Head over to devtools.fm slash sponsor to apply. Also, if you haven't signed up for our newsletter, you gotta. There's no better place to get notified about all the new episodes DevTools is putting out, as well as all the cool DevTools news that's happening week to week. And this week, we just opened up our Discord. Come join us. And with that, let's get back to the episode. I'm sure you have a lot of uh, other really interesting war stories over your years at NPM. Uh, what's, what's, besides the left pad thing, what's one of the most memorable? You know, one of the tricky things about being a founder or a CEO or, or, you know, any kind of like leader at a company is you end up with a lot of secrets that you're like legally required to not ever share. Um, <laughs> but, but would make really good content if you could, uh, I don't know. Um, so, uh, I mean, a, a lot of them, it ends up sort of, uh, if I, if I were to try to tell the story in a way that's, um, sanitized for for our purposes here it wouldn't be super interesting and be sort of what you could read just by looking it up online i will say one thing that's really interesting which i didn't i didn't appreciate until i was sitting in that in that position is i i just anytime there's drama at a company anytime there's a reason for people to be mad at a startup at a company at a founder at an employee whatever and it and these sorts of kerfuffles like leak out into the public sphere it is without fail different from the story that you heard like 100 percent of the time I'm, I'm willing to like that is it that is an absolute you never get the full story um that's not to say that you shouldn't be mad at the person that the story makes you mad at maybe you should be a lot madder right uh 
most often like what ends up happening is like these stories and these situations and these things like get utterly stripped of any of their subtlety and they get sort of packaged into like the nearest approximation that a reporter could get someone to tell them and a reporter could wrap their head around and sort of package into a nice bite-sized story. Um, most often everyone involved is super messy. Everybody is, everybody is implicated. Everybody is doing their best. Everybody's trying very hard and means well, like, and, and everybody screws up and, you know, has, has insecurities and emotions and everything else that makes human beings messy. So yeah, that's, that's kind of the main, the main takeaway I had there, you know, and we, we had a handful of those. We had some, I hired a CEO, uh, cause it's what you have to do sometimes, um, when you're a venture backed company and your investors insist, um, that didn't go as well as it could have, <laughs> guess, uh, to put it, to put it very lightly, a hard role to hire for. To be fair, I feel like giving someone the helm, a finding someone who's risen to that position who's not a complete sociopath. Uh, no, no, no shade on sociopaths, and people have to exist. I mean, impossible, impossible requirement right there. You know, and and the thing that made me realize, like going through going through that a, a couple of of just sort of brutal news cycles at NBM, um, and also seeing the whole like IOJS mm -hmm. no JS thing up close. And then seeing the just wide difference in like public perception versus what was actually happening and how the two are like not even really connected, you know, and people would be like mad at joint for something. And I'm like, no, that's not don't that's not the right reason to be mad at them. Like <laughs> it's, it's not even that you're wrong, like you're mad at the right person, but for the wrong reasons, actually, that thing that you're mad about was a good thing that they did. And this other thing I can't tell you is why I'm mad at them. Um, so yeah, that was, you know, that was, that was always one, uh, the big takeaway there for me, the big, like growing up thing was realizing that like, mm -hmm. yeah, the story on Twitter is wrong. Well, I think Twitter it's in particular fail. is a platform with no nuance, right? I mean, it's constrained by design. And, and also I think as we've had decreasing oh. attention spans, even our news articles can tend to be smaller and like lacking in context in some way. So I feel like these situations are more prominent now. I don't know if I agree that it's Twitter. I think we've been I think we've been idiots forever. Sure too. <laughs> like I really do because because even even when even when you have longer form things or or you know the situations where it's like you know where there's room to kind of discuss and get into the nuance, right? Like things like actual news articles or Reddit or hacker news or like just meeting somebody and talking to them about it, right? Like you we're just so prone to we're like, we're so optimized for the story that we can wrap our head around and accepting that. And I mean, even if you look back, like, I mean, this, this stuff goes back as far as we have history for, right? Like people have always kind of accepted the easy, uh, the easy to understand story. And then when you start getting into the nuance, you realize like, oh, like it's way more complicated. I don't know most of it. In fact, I can't possibly know most of it because it's gone. Right. It's just like, yeah. That's just reality. Like our, our histories are invented on the fly. So I was getting a little, a little far afield, a little meta. No, it's, it's fine. Uh, one more last question on the past before we move on to what you've currently been working on. Uh, N Node and NPM have been managed in very different ways. Like Node is more of like an open source cross company sort of thing where NPM became, as you said, a private venture backed company. So, uh, do you think that happening was better for the long-term health of, of MPM and like kind of set it up to be where we are today? Or do you think it could have gone the same uh, route as Node? Well, Node and NPM are very, very different things, right? They're, they are connected only in so far as like NPM is a Node program mm -hmm. um, and it's used by a lot of the same people and like they ship together, the, the client ships with the Node binary, but like the, the actual work of maintaining it is very different. Um, the code base, like the API surface of the NPM client is relatively small, um, compared with the API surface of Node.js, right? Um, and the, the amount of kind of, uh, complexity involved with maintaining the code itself, like the client code itself is dramatically smaller. On the other hand, 
NPM is a web service. It's a it's a, a hosting service and a distribution platform. It's got you know CDNs and servers and so on. And that part, like Node, doesn't have that. Node has some build processes that like mostly run on GitHub Actions and Jenkins. Like that's it. That's the server side bits of of running the Node project. I guess there's a website too. And so just like where the investment is needed, you know, like Node needs a lot of people contributing time and attention to the code base itself. And that actually lends itself really well to a, a big community run sort of foundation run project, because what you need is just to like throw, throw devs at it. Um, NPM, on the other hand, doesn't actually need a huge staff or a ton of people. What it needs is like good ops and hosting bills to be paid. So uh, yeah, it's a, Node actually, Ryan wrote it, wrote the, kind of the initial version, which wasn't really very useful. Um, I mean, it was useful, it was cool, but it wasn't like nobody was putting it into production. And then he was hired by Joyent and they also bought as part of his you know, hiring, they, they acquired the, the Node IP. So you know, the name, the code, the platform, that's why everything is copyright Joyent when you look at the, in the code base. Um, or everything before, you know, the move to a foundation. So it was actually also run as a, you know, a private for company, for profit, uh, company for a while. And PM, so we got to a point when I was, I was working at joint for a while. I, I, I joined, um, Ryan actually recruited me, um, and we worked together for about a, what about two years and then i stayed on for another like close to two years as as the you know the bdfl the benevolent dictator for a little while uh until i left as well when i joined i mean i'd already started npm and or i'd already you know created the project there was no company yet and they didn't really want to well they kind of they <laughs> there was once kind of a half-hearted offer to acquire npm as well and i was like there's like two few zeros on this offer so no thank you um, like, I don't, I don't think we're even, it didn't get, even get to the point of like writing anything down. I was just like, mm, no, nah, I'll just keep it. Uh, so it, it, uh, hosting was donated first by, um, couch IO, which became couch one, which became Iris couch, which became no jitsu. And then it got to the point where no jitsu could not, uh, continue offering that for free. They couldn't afford to keep doing it. And um, there were some pretty big issues that happened. I don't know if you were, if you were around at the uh, end of 2013, there was, a, there was a month there where we had like one nine of uptime and it was not in the tens place. <laughs> it was bad. Uh, it was, I, I, that's not exaggeration either. There was, a, there was like a, a week or something where there was like 9.8% uptime. So that was, that was kind of a disaster. And it was pretty clear that like this thing needs funding it needs backing and it needs it in a hurry. So I looked at what I could do. It was like a very short list of options. Um, I could just let it die. I could say, well, this was a, this was a, a good run. Figure something else out now, I guess, start putting your packages in get repos or something. Um, and that idea just like, that seemed like it sucked. That that wasn't good. Like we'd seen what that looked like. We'd seen what the JavaScript ecosystem looks like without uh, an easy to use package manager. And it wasn't as good. Like it didn't grow as quickly. There wasn't as much innovation. Like that's just not an option. So the other option was I could pay for it out of pocket. And it's like, okay, well, I don't have, you know, tens of thousands of dollars per month that I can spend on this thing. Like that's not going to happen. Um, find another corporate donor wasn't super into the idea of, you know, Google or whoever like owning NPM at that point in, in time. And, um, yeah, joint actually offered to, to take over running it and, and providing hosting and stuff. But again, in exchange for taking the IP and I was like, no, um, plus that's just like, okay, then I just have a job like, and I don't actually get a ton of control over like how this is going to be run or we could start a company. Um, or I could start a foundation. Starting a foundation took, takes more time and really sort of creating something that has the ability to generate the amount of, of money, like cash that's needed to keep a service like that running 
as an open source foundation, like a 50, what is it? 503B um, uh, trade, trade, what is it? It's like a, oh, well, I forget it. Um, it's some, it's like, it's not a, it's not a charity. It's a, uh, but it's a foundation, which is a not-for-profit that's like designed to be a consortium of people within a given, uh, of companies within a given industry. It's how most open source foundations are. And so doing something like that, that could, that could produce like the actual amount of, of capital and revenue to, to keep this thing running was just a lot of, you know, it'd be a pretty tall order. Uh, it'd be pretty uncommon. So I thought, all right, well, let's probably we could figure out a way to make money with this thing. Let's start a company and maybe the company can keep it running. And so that's what we did. You know, I, I think uh, given my experience with it and given my sort of what I saw, again, you know, the stories are always more complicated and more subtle than you think. Like people think it's, it's not uncommon to find somebody who thinks that like VCs are evil or like VC money is suspect, yada, yada, yada. And like, I, it's not as simple as saying that VCs are evil. There's a lot of evil VCs. I'm not saying they're not, but like, also there's a lot of evil founders and a lot of times they just let the VCs be the bad guy. Cause you know, you know, you're, you know, those venture capitalists, they're just forcing me to not give you guys any kind of piece of this exit. No, oh, well, it's like, yeah, no, you just, you just wanted to keep the money for yourself. That's all. Um, so yeah, as, as, that's another thing. As a founder, you find out like, oh, I've got all kinds of freedom here. All that stuff that people said venture capitals forced them to do. Like they, that's just, that was just you being greedy. Um, the things they actually force you to do are way worse. Yeah, so so we started this company and um, it was good for a while. We uh, We did, there are definitely some things in terms of like 2020 hindsight that I would do differently there. I think we over-indexed on uh, trying to create an enterprise product, trying to create like a standalone, host your own enterprise version of the NPM registry. A, nobody wants that. B, the people who do want that, they don't want it just for NPM. They want a, a thing that they put in their data server that handles everything, that handles their Git repos, that handles their files that their accounting team is managing, that handles, you know, Perl modules and, and, the downloadable binaries or the things that they ship on their web, like they want a end to end whole company artifact solution. And the space isn't that big. They're not willing to pay that much for it. They're certainly not willing to get more than one of those things. On the other hand, people who are much smaller, you know, or, or companies that are much smaller or individuals are willing to pay a couple bucks a month for like, look, I just need to like a place to put these artifacts. Like I've got everything else managed. I just want to be able to like, have us all share our stuff, right? They'll pay a couple of bucks for that. They pay for a private GitHub account. They pay for, you know, Google apps for domains so that they can share their spreadsheets. Like they're not looking for an all-in-one solution. They're looking for a lot of cheap, easy, like click a button and it just works type of solutions. So what we found was we spent all of this time and all of this attention and energy on, you know, building and marketing and selling and trying to to be successful with this like enterprise solution that you could stand up in your own data center. And for a little while, it was providing about half of our revenue. And then um, we a, a big cost, big company, uh, big customer churned, and we just never really recovered from that. And meanwhile, despite receiving approximately zero of our marketing budget and at literally zero of our sales budget, uh, the, the sort of SMB and individual uh, private packages product just kept steadily growing until it was producing a significant chunk of our revenue. And yeah, I mean, in hindsight, I would have long, while I still had control enough of the, of the company and control enough of the shares of the company, I would have just dropped our enterprise product like, like a bad habit and said, look, we're just going to focus on the SMB thing. We're going to market the hell out of it. We're going to try and get this thing to grow organically. Um, it's what I knew. It's what I understood kind of how to, how to run. But I was like, we had pitched this enterprise thing in order to raise money. We had a bunch of investors who had had, you know, good success with companies like, um, like HashiCorp or, or Snowflake that 
did an open source thing and then went and sold the big enterprise deals. And there's something to be said about it because enterprise deals have an unlimited, virtually unlimited upside per deal. Whereas um, if you're selling something as a SaaS, as a, as a self-service SaaS, your, your total top line, like your total upside potential, your total customer value potential is pretty low per customer. Um, so even if you're getting like, you know, and getting a million customers that pay you $10 a month, is objectively worse than having one com- one customer that pays you ten million dollars a month, right? Like it's more risky to have that one because, like, happened with us, like they can churn. But that's one person you got to keep happy, like easy, you're right. And you and there's a thousand more of them, so the the upside is is much bigger. Um, but yeah, it didn't, it didn't end up working out for NPM. Um, I kind of came to this conclusion way later than I really ought to have. And by the time I did, it was like they were able to kind of put their foot down and be like, no, like if you don't want to sell our enterprise product, we want a CEO who will. And I was like, Ugh, all right, fine. Just basically that or get fired from my own company. So <laughs> <laughs> I did not want to go that route. So uh, yeah, where were we? Okay, so yeah, running NPM, running Node, very different. In the end, I think, uh, you know, we, we had an exit that did not put anybody in a position where they could like retire and be set for life. It was like, I got a good job and a bit of a bonus. Um, I think when I looked back over the, over the last 12 years, kind of sadly, I was like, you know, if I just like had stayed at Yahoo all that time, I would be better off financially than I am after this sale of the company. Um, But it was also a lot more fun and interesting, or at least interesting. Well, I, for one, am thankful for you going on that journey because it it has been a pillar in like my development journey throughout my life. So thank you for going on it. Uh, I love NPM and I hope to see it stay around for a long time. Well, and I mean, the thing is like GitHub's not a bad place for it. I think... um, as as exits go for like what was yeah, it's tempting to like look at any company we we have this idea that like our fiduciary duty as as company founders or leaders or whatever is to like maximize value for shareholders and like okay so i kind of failed at that like but the purpose of npm the actual mission of npm was not to make money for its investors i mean that was legally what it had to try to do um because that's what a Delaware C Corp is kind of required to do. But it, um, you know, for me personally, my intrinsic motivation was like making sure that the registry stays running and that the system can kind of continue and keep going. And like GitHub's committed to that. I believe that GitHub's committed to that. I make, I mean, I don't know, maybe they'll shut it down tomorrow and I'll feel like a jerk for saying that. But like, it's, it's gone a lot longer than it would have if it had just stayed a side project. That's for sure. Yeah. So reasonably you know middling success it's a very valuable story to hear because it's i mean one thing that we talk to a lot of folks who do dev tools uh, or build companies around tools i mean a lot of these start as open source a lot of them start as passion projects or like hey you know i want to do this and then i want to turn it into some business uh and we've seen a lot of different models and you know sometimes you go more the aqua hire route of you know, Ryan and Joyan, and sometimes it's like, you know, going to start a business behind this or try to bootstrap a business behind it. But I think all these learnings are are, are incredibly valuable to hear anyway, because, you know, I, I think as pivotal as NPM has been, just not only in the service itself, but in how it's changed, how we think about dependencies, both for good and for bad, uh, I think it's been incredibly valuable as a key like source of inspiration. And I hope that, you know, other people hearing this can uh, learn some lessons from your journey, but also be encouraged to sort of take their own steps and, you know, figuring out how to make their, you know, tool the, you know, thing that they can, they can do. I, I always, I always advocate for people to do what they're passionate about. You know, if you can make it financially viable, do it, you know? So one, I mean, one thing that I think is uh, this, just, just, part of being old and cynical, like there are, there is a kind of a common pattern now where 
you will see a tool get very popular. And, you know, we're seeing this with Bun, we saw it with Dino. And it, it gets popular in part because it's a legitimately useful or interesting or innovative tool, yes, but also because there's a financial entity behind it that's pouring marketing into it. And again, like I'm not, I'm not trying to say that NPM wasn't that kind of thing. I mean, it, it wasn't for the first four years. It was just my own thing. Like the, the sum total of the marketing budget was every once in a while, I would like make some stickers and hand them out at a meetup or something. But like the, um, yeah, then we had a, we had a company and we raised a couple million dollars. Like we spent a bunch of that on just trying to get people to like feel good about NPM and know about it and use it. And talk about how great it was. And what can actually happen is that like sometimes that the that like marketing machine, that engine of capital that gets put behind a company, like, you know, I'm going to pick on Bun a little bit just because it's sort of like the most recent thing, but there's nothing, this isn't unique to Bun at all, but it's a common pattern. It's a common enough pattern that you see in this, in this kind of hype cycle, right? Like there are, um, you know, and I don't want to, again, like I don't want to pick on Bun in particular, but just use it as an example, like there is a company behind that. That company has investors. Those investors decided to put up quite a bit of money in order to build this thing that they hope that they have been led to believe will lead to some financial return for them and their limited partners. Um, that's like, that's how the game works. And so what happens if that does happen, if that doesn't happen, and like, what do all of those outcomes kind of look like? And, and what does that mean in terms of like the believability of a lot of the marketing messages? I think that Jared Sumner's is generally acting in good faith, right? Like he's been working on Bun a long time. He's done some really interesting and good work on it. Like, yeah, that's, that seems great. One of two things is probably going to happen. Either Bun will become extremely popular and useful and they will figure out a way to monetize and whatever it is that they're doing for money will become their main priority or it won't. And then that's really kind of puts the whole project in a very precarious position because now you've got like, you know, like if you buy a house and it turns out that it's like not livable or whatever, you don't just burn it to the ground or say, okay, well, whoever can have it. No, like you, you go in there and you rip the pipes out and you try to sell them for scrap metal or whatever. Like that's what happens. It gets, it gets pretty gross when things start going that route. And there are entire industries that are like designed to do this with companies that will like chop up a company and try to sell its IP for parts, you know, for pennies on the dollar. So, yeah, so I am somewhat, I, I have a, a somewhat of the like, you know, reserved level of excitement every time I see one of these like, oh, like great new best ever node killer, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, cool. Well, like you're, you're only saying that because you've been paid to. So A, like I don't entirely believe you and B, good luck with that. I wish you the best and I am going to keep sort of putting my, you know, putting my actual like reliance on things that are a little bit more, um, you know, reliable for the long term. I'll keep an eye on it. I like Bun. I think it's great. I just, it's also VC funded. So it's potentially can turn into a somewhat dangerous animal to really rely on. Yeah, whenever I hear those like uh, exaggerated claims uh, that come out from new people that are like another one that I saw recently was like new JS, which it's kind of N U E, and it's like claiming all of these things, and it's like you made a thing that has probably only existed for a few months. It probably doesn't address like ninety percent of what the tool you're trying to replace does and you're oh yeah that's that's the one that oh yeah that's the one that they, they decided to die on the hill of calling their branch master <laughs> oh wow yeah it's really not a big deal that's why you dedicated a whole section of your read me yeah okay good luck yeah sure sure me 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 think the lady doth protest too much or whatever like but uh you know, anyway uh, yeah i i think i'd be more successful in a lot of my open source projects if i was um more more aggressively into the hype cycle i wrote um i remember a long time ago i wrote this like blog post that was like intentionally ludicrous about npm that was like you know top 10 reasons why npm is the best package manager of all time and blah 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 and like 
I think it should have been really clear reading it that like it was a joke. It was not supposed to be taken seriously. I was like throwing in all caps and stuff in there and like I don't know, people people cite it as like a normal thing. Some people got mad about it. They're like, I just why are people get into this like hype cycle? I'm like, did you how do you not get this parody? But in the whole front page of of uh like the node top website, I have this whole section that's like basically just saying like hey look this is my preference and this is how i like things if you like it this way you'll probably like this thing and if not you won't good luck with that like you know do whatever you want but yeah it's it would probably be a more popular test framework if i didn't do that well as you as you fundamentally know <laughs> popularity comes with its own price <laughs> it does it does it is not free especially in open source Speaking of not free, I would like to transition to talk about your current endeavor. Uh, so you are working uh, on a product company called Tier. I I co-founded Tier. Um, I've been I've been in sort of a uh, not as full time with it. <laughs> I've been actually kind of taking a little bit of a break from it to uh, to focus on on a bunch of open source stuff, which is why I've been so active in open source lately in like the last couple of months. Um, but uh, but Tier is really interesting and they're doing some very exciting stuff. Um, so one of the big challenges that I that I found in running NPM and one of the things that I think made it hard for us to um, to be as successful as we could have been, especially with our self-service product, was that we sort of picked a pricing model and we're more or less stuck with it. You know, it this is one of those things that like, you can tell you can tell whether somebody's actually run a startup and run a product in a real way in production by how they respond to this story. Like, do they go, "Oh my god, yeah, that happened to me." Like, that's always this, always the way it goes. Or do they go, "Like, I don't get why that's a problem. Why didn't you just?" And then they have some asinine reason that it's like obviously you can't do that. Um, and I'm like, I went from one camp to the other. You know, the way that so many people do. Uh, we, we did a lot of like research and analysis and thought and careful examination of things. And we decided on like a very sensible, like way that we could price our product that made, you know, that seemed totally reasonable. And it was like trying to kind of capture the value and it was intelligible and we ran it by people and everybody said, yes, I would totally buy this. And like, this matches how we're paying for other things. Like we did everything you're supposed to do. And we went out with this plan that was uh, $7 a month per seat per, you know, per user, basically. And um, if you were an organization, it was just $7 per member of that organization. And if you're an individual, it's just $7 for your, for your plan. Dead simple. The one thing we kept hearing over and over again was like, the pricing needs to be super simple. You need to reason about, et cetera. And like right away, I mean, right away, it started becoming a problem because you have to be a member of an organization in order to get access to that organization's private packages. So what did all these companies do? They said, well, you know, look, we have a hundred developers, but only two of them are ever publishing packages who are, you know, only, oh, there's only four people on our tools team and they're the only ones who are publishing anything. So everybody who's just read only should have like a lower price. And we like, we were like, well, we're not really like, we didn't really set it up to be able to do that, first of all. Second of all, like, yeah, that's included in the $7 thing. Like, we, we did a lot of math to figure out how much you cost us and how much we need to make. And like, no, if we just, they're like, well, I mean, I'd pay extra for the read-write users. You know, when we figured it out, we were like, okay, well, if we, if we required, like, people with write access to pay, like, $12 a month, then we can make everybody with read-only access like two or three dollars a month. It would still kind of work out the same. I don't remember the exact numbers, so you know that's very hand wavy, but it, it was something in that neighborhood. And people would have been okay with that. But again, like we just were using Stripe inventory billing, like we were just bumping a counter up and down based on the number of accounts that there are in your in your organization. And we had said that like that number is worth seven dollars each per month. And so like Stripe did all the amortization and everything. Changing that ended up being really, really hard because that like magic number, how many seats you have is just like threaded and hard coded through the entire system. 
um, we had checks everywhere that were like, you know, there were certain features that were only enabled if you're a paid account. So there's checks that are like, if, if entity dot plan equals pro, then blah, blah, blah. And it's like, okay, well, even if we wanted to experiment with this, like we're going to have to run that like feature flag through our entire website on like every page because everything is like hard coded to look at the plan name. So we can't even change the plan name very easily. And it just all in all, like made it very difficult to experiment. Um, Jevin McDonald is, was the, um, actually part of the first, he was the first angel investor to get on board with NPM Inc. Um, and so I've known him since then. And he had a company called um, Manifold, which eventually they, they were kind of like a, um, like a marketplace for SaaS providers. Um, and what he found was that like the really, at the, the thing that people found most compelling about Manifold from the, from the, you know, the SaaS provider point of view was just their pricing page system because they let you like sort of turn some dials and have a pricing page get spit out. And what he found was company, they would, they would get, um, you know, I told the story, like they would have users complain to them and say, Hey, the price is different on the Manifold site from on the actual website. Like how come it's not even like it's more or less, it's just like completely different. Like why does Manifold have the wrong prices? And they would look and be like, no, like, well, we're, we're showing you the pricing page that the, the customer like configured it to show, like we're doing the right thing. They reach out to the customers to be like, Hey, like, do you know that your, your prices are out of sync? Like, let's see if we can help you like resolve this, you know, that you can just serve your pricing page from us and then it'll always be synced up. And they were like, no, 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 we're doing an A-B test. Like, this is literally the only way we can do that is that we have like you as one route that people can buy our product and that's one pricing page. And then we have the other pricing page, which is generated by Stripe. And that's the other way that people can buy our product. And we just like have our marketing send them to one of the other pricing flows. And he was just like, oh my God, this is, that is ludicrous. That is so much extra, you know, overhead. We've heard stories about people like if they want to run a promotion and it's, we did some, we resorted to some of the stuff at NPM Inc too. Like you want to run a promotion and literally the only way to do it is like, you know, have a button that when somebody clicks it, it like adds a row to a Google sheet. And then you've got some poor support staff sitting in discord or Slack that gets pinged. And then they have to go into Stripe and like toggle some button with their human meat fingers. Like these systems are bad and they're like held together by chewing gum and bailing wire. And it's the core of your business. It's literally the most important thing about your business. Um, because then it's like coming back on the other side, right? Once the sale happens, you want to be able to go back after a month or a quarter with your BI system and say, okay, well, which promotion worked, which plan is most popular, you know, like, how much money are we getting from this product versus this other product versus our enterprise thing versus the, you know, the self-serve thing, whatever. And so that's kind of how the, the idea of tier came about, which was like, what if you could just have something that's like package JSON that's like, but instead of that, it's pricing.json. And it's just a configuration that says, these are my plans and this is how much they cost. Go make that my pricing. Um, then in your in your code, instead of having, you know, if user.plan equals pro show XYZ feature, you say if user dot, you know, you say if this user can see this feature, then show it. Right. So you sort of decouple through that layer of abstraction um, what plan they're on from which features they have access to. What that means is you can have as many different plans as you want. You could have a different plan for every customer if you wanted. It'd be totally fine. Um, because at that point, the, the point of interaction that a dev actually cares about is like, should I show this feature or not? And this user has used this feature, right? So it's like, that's kind of the only thing that you care about in the application. It's the only thing the application should care about. Over on the purchasing side, it should care about which plan are they buying and just that's it. Um, on the billing side, it should care about which plan are they on and which uh, features did they consume? Or technically, which features did they consume at what prices? Um, and on the, 
and that's also kind of what the what the BI cares about, right? Because it wants to know like how do we track those prices back to a plan or uh, a marketing or promotion promotional activity. On the marketing side and on the presentation side, you want to be able to say like what are the plans and the prices that I want to offer. And you want to make sure that whatever you're offering on your pricing page is what they will actually end up paying after they sign up. Otherwise, that is a recipe for disaster. Um, you get users who are very upset if they think that something is going to cost a dollar a piece and you charge them $10 for seven of them. And they're just like, this isn't even, it's not even wrong. It's just like, you're, I didn't know that it was going to be divided by that. Like, you know, or you said that they would get 10 free, but you actually start charging them for the after five, like whatever it is, um, that just causes a lot of, a lot of problems. And also whatever you sell via a salesperson really should go into the same system. Or at some point you have to reconcile those things because if I buy something on the website versus I buy something by signing a document and it being turned on for my account by my account executive, like it should, it should be the same. The app should know that I have access to this feature. So, um, yeah, so tier was kind of like designed to be like that missing nexus of information, that missing kind of like orchestration layer. Um, and what it takes the place of really, you know, people have looked at it. One question we got was like, oh, so it's just like a wrapper around Stripe. It's like, well, it's a wrapper around all the broken ass crap your company is doing. Like <laughs> it's, it's a wrapper around a lot of wasted time that you're going to spend re-implementing all parts of price ops if you don't use a tool that just does it for you. Um, you know, if all of this stuff is kind of like hard coded and threaded throughout your entire application or implemented kind of implicitly by, well, every time there's a sale, we just know that we have to go update the spreadsheet, um, which is like, that's state of the art. That's normal. That's how most people do it. Um, if they're very fancy, they have some integration with their Salesforce system that automatically updates that list. But like, yeah, it's it's really um, it's really an area that I think more more companies ought to spend a bit of time optimizing and could really be much more nimble and much more uh, efficient and successful if they did. One thing that's interesting, so that term uh, price ops that was actually coined, um, I think, as a as a joke uh, by uh, by our co-founder, uh, Blake. And yeah, then we, we sort of kept using it and we saw that it really resonated in a lot of the conversations that we had. Um, and so we wrote up this, uh, priceops.org, which is the, the five pillars of price ops, which we very just shamelessly tried to make look as much as possible, like the 12 factor app, you know, it's got a very similar kind of like approach and just like, Hey, look, this is not, we're not saying you have to use us, but like, this is how you should do it. Um, and that just kind of goes through like the main data components and the, the main parts of this overall infrastructure and your overall like process that need to be able to fit together in a compatible way in order for your company to be able to make changes to your pricing model without totally ruining everything without it being a disaster every time. And we've talked to companies where it's like, yeah, we wanted to change our pricing in, or we wanted to add some like, you know, go from charging per bandwidth to per like unit of storage. And it's a six month process that takes the entire company's attention and $3 million. It's like, why? Okay. That, yeah. You better hope that that was a good idea because if it's that hard to make that kind of change, that means it's not something that you can change every week. It's not something that you can just like try on a whim. Um, and so you get, you know, these poor product marketing folks who like come into these startups with all, you know, they, they come in on their job interview, they're all full of great ideas and they're just like, want to hit the ground running and do a bunch of fun stuff. And then just very, you know, either very slowly or very swiftly, their, their spirit is just crushed. It's just like, oh, well, uh, to do that is going to require touching the auth system. And like, we don't touch the auth system. Uh, so I don't know, maybe we could find some engineering resources next quarter. Yeah, that resonates a lot. Uh, and I, I think this this is an echo of another theme that we've had a lot on the show of the sort of incidental complexity around running a company. Is just like people get really excited about the the original project, you know, the original tool that you're mm -hmm. building, this thing that you have a passion for, and you're like, okay, I'm going to turn this into a company. 
And then all of a sudden, there are all these things that you never really thought about <laughs> that become really hard when you don't think that they should be really hard. <laughs> so, I mean, pricing is a great example of that. Not just like, how much do we charge? But like, how do we actually integrate this? And how do we really build a sort of a product layer around mm -hmm. this tool that we're trying to sell? Yeah. And yeah, I mean, see the, you know, see also the, the earlier comment about, um, when corporate funded open source projects don't pay their rent, like getting evicted is not fun. Yeah. Other thing that just before we move on, uh, I'm always a strong proponent of like thinking early and often about like what your business model is. I mean, you know, yeah. I think there was a time, especially when you could get away with more just like fast and loose. It's like, ah, we'll figure it out down the road. But like, I don't know that it really behooves you to do that because you're going to end up making choices that are really going to affect people's lives. You know, it's like hiring people and like doing a bunch of stuff like that. And, you know, I don't know. I think it, I think it's, uh, I won't say it's like a moral prerogative, but almost to that degree is just like, you know, you should really think about it. Of course. <laughs> I think it's fair to say it's a moral prerogative. I mean, I, th I think, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. And if you're running a company, like you kind of have more power than most of the people that you employ. It's, it depends on obviously what market you're in and what you're doing, right? If you're if you're hiring if you're hiring software developers who could just walk down the street and get a job anywhere, like they obviously have quite a bit of of leverage just through that. But you know, the company is always in a some is in a stronger position. Like the company has a bunch of lawyers and a bunch of capital. Like how many employees come into that relationship with a million dollars in the bank and a team of lawyers on their team? Like none. But that's not uncommon for the company to have. In fact, it'd be weird for it not to. So like, yeah, it's, it, it is absolutely a, a huge responsibility. I think if you have, if you have employees to like, make sure that you are thinking very carefully and, and very upfront about like, if you don't like what you know and what you don't know, we tried to do that at NPM, at least to be, to be pretty clear about sort of what the plan was and what we hoped would work and that it was a risk. Um, but also it's like the longer you go, the more, the more people assume you must know what you're doing. <laughs> That's not always the case. Okay. Uh, so switching gears a little bit, uh, Node is currently and has been going through a transition from uh, CJS, which you are a, a, a large like proponent of and like the person who wrote the initial implementation too, I think. I was involved. I don't think I <laughs> wrote it alone. I definitely touched it a lot. Yeah, fingerprints all over it. Currently, the whole ecosystem is going through a transition to ESM, and this transition uh, has not been uh, a quick or a smooth one. Uh, a lot of people have compared it to the transition of Python 2 to 3. So uh, from your perspective, why do you think it's taken so long for us to get over the finish line? And uh, what, do you th what do you think needs to be done to get us there? Like recently I saw a tool from you called i think it's called tushy that's, that's one way to pronounce it <laughs> uh and that tool lets you uh easily ship dual cjs esm support for a typescript package uh mm -hmm. so I, I like seeing tools like that but do you think that's something that we need to get past the finish line or what do you think that process is going to be like well i think uh the comparison to python 2 and 3 is is somewhat fair and somewhat not um, I mean, it's not a different, it's not a fundamentally different language, but like, okay, so back up, a, back up a step. Yeah. What, what does it take to get over the finish line? I don't think it's clear what the finish line is. Um, but if we were to even sort of talk about the finishing area, you know, without maybe a clearly defined like line, there are some things in node that are still not yet sort of at the point where they can be called stable um, regarding ESM. So there, a lot of them are very close. Like there's been a lot of work on it. And I'm not saying this to like complain about no, it's just like this stuff is hard sometimes. And there's things that have a lot of, a lot of uh, subtlety and complexity to get that have to get, you know, you really have to get them right. Um, but like in, uh, in common JS, there's this thing called require.extensions that you can use to specify sort of to define a, a, a function that loads modules of a particular file type. So anything that ends in .js gets run with this, you know, function that sort of reads the file and evaluates the contents and 
and so on. Um, anything that ends in dot node gets process dot DL open called on it and uh, returns the results of that. Uh, and so that was a thing that, you know, in the days before TypeScript, when the main transpiled language was CoffeeScript, um, which now, I mean, if you, when you talk about like transpiling and other languages, it's like TypeScript is well over 99% of transpilation. It's just like, that's the one, that's the one that we're talking about. CoffeeScript was cool. Almost nobody uses it. If you use CoffeeScript and I just offended you, I'm really sorry, but like, get over it. Like it's not relevant. Um, TypeScript, however, is very relevant. And the way that a lot of these things were built was using require.extensions. Well, in the ECMAScript standard, there's nothing like that. Like uh, in the, the ECMAScript modules spec, there's nothing like that. And in Node's ESM implementation, the closest thing to that is uh, something called loaders. And so a, a the runtime can, so when, when you embed V8, you can basically run things in such a way that you say, if there's a module that gets imported, like this is how you resolve it and this is how you load it. Because the language itself doesn't have any concept of what is a file, of what is a web request, like what is a, how to make fetch requests, whatever. Like that's not the stuff that the language is sort of interested in specifying. Um, what, the what the language does specify is, you know, when, when this kind of code is evaluated, here's the, here's the interface that the runtime needs to provide, that the host platform needs to provide. And so that's, that's what it specifies. And V8 gives it, has some ways to, to hook into those things um, that, you know, Chrome and Node and any other thing in you know, using V8 can, can hook into. And so what Node uh, did, what they came up with was a way to say, all right, you can run node dash dash loader equals something. And that something can export some functions that, um, that Node will then call in the process of like loading and, and uh, resolving and loading the various modules. And there's no spec for exactly what that needs to look like. Um, it's from the, from the language spec, it's just like host platform does host platform things. And then a module happens. Um, and so browsers have taken to mean that like, it's a URL, I'm going to load it. Like it's a JavaScript file, parse it in module mode and, you know, in its own kind of, kind of, um, somewhat like a closure environment and then provide all the things that got exported, uh, in know that's meant some kind of interesting things because we were already requiring packages. Like you don't do require dot slash node modules slash express slash lib slash index dot JS. Like you just want to be able to do require express and get express. So in order for it to even begin to be possible to be useful, like we had to have some way to do that. And so the node um, ecosystem, like, or, or so the node loader went through quite a lot of back and forth. I mean, over the last, what, close to 10 years now of, of just kind of like iteration and gradual improvements to get to the point where now we have a loader spec that is actually kind of close to being um, uh, marked as stable or at least not experimental anymore. And yeah, so as far as like, you know, why aren't we over the finish line? It's like, well, because like we're not over the finish line as a community because the project isn't over the finish line yet. Like the runtime is not really marked ESM as ready for prime time, even though there are parts of it that are like, yeah, it's like, it's ready for prime time unless you want to do anything with it. Like, unless you want to be able to run your code and get code coverage or, uh, you know, run TypeScript or, or whatever. Um, but at the same time, the, the challenge with experimental API surfaces and a runtime like Node is like, if you don't support it at least a little, then nobody's going to use it. And so you do still need to like fix bugs in it and not break it capriciously. But at the same time, like you do need to know that like it's not final and it's going to break because you, you didn't like you can't know that until you play test it. So there's kind of this like chicken and egg. Or, or, you know, 
catch 22 problem where like you need to communicate that something's not stable, but then also get people over the hurdle of using it. The thing that anyway, the thing that is kind of like Python 3 is that packages that are written in ESM cannot be loaded with require, which means if you have some code that does require chalk, like it doesn't work with the latest version of chalk. You can import chalk and you can also import things that use require. You know, you can also import CommonJS. So why not just write it in CommonJS because then that can be loaded everywhere, except that then we're not ever making that transition. Like things that use, in, and also things that you import from common, things that are written in CommonJS that you import from ESM. Um, it's a little awkward. Like the return shape is a little different. It can never really, it can never be compatible easily with something like Dino or a web browser that only implements ESM and does not support require unless you do a bunch of translation, which I know I said it's, I, I said there's no coffee script anymore. It's all TypeScript. Other than TypeScript, the other reason to transpile is stuff like Webpack and Babel, which just massage things into CommonJS or out of CommonJS, essentially, um, for use in web browsers or in Node, respectively. No, flip that, whatever. Uh, so yeah, one thing that I think is kind of just the way that I've decided to go about handling this situation, um, personally, I... I like the ergonomics of writing ESM better than common JS, which might be weird because, you know, I'm like one of the common JS original proponents, <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's just, it's just a little bit nicer and you get top level away. Like you can load anything, including all of Cinder Sorghus's code. And I use a lot of Cinder Sorghus's code. Like, well, I'm not going to rewrite chalk. It's just silly. Like. Just use the one that's out there. It's ESM, whatever. And so, yeah, so I wrote, I wrote Tushy. Um, what it does, what Tushy does is, and, and people have made all kinds of like butt puns about this. It's just great. It's like, it's an export manager. It shapes your exports. I didn't, I didn't even think of it that way, but that's quality <laughs> humor. Also, it's like, it's like you got the common JS and you got the ESM. I don't, yeah. So anyway, uh, it's a it's a TypeScript hybridizer. T S I. That's the the actual pronunciation. Mm, dirty minds out of the gutter. Um, <laughs> I would have never gotten that. <laughs> <laughs> it's right there in the in the readme at the top. It's like TypeScript hybridizer tushy. Um, uh, so what this does is it basically builds your code in ESM mode. Um, and it's very, very opinionated. It, it, it reads a small amount of config in your package JSON, and then it produces much more config in your package JSON. Um, but it figures out like, okay, like, you know, do you have a source slash index.ts? All right, I'm gonna build that to dist slash ESM slash index.ts. I'm also gonna build that to dist slash commonjs slash index.ts and then set up the exports in your package.json properly so that when somebody requires your package, they get the common JS, and when they import your package, they get the ESM. Um, and this evolved out of uh, initially handcrafted exports and build processes. Um, and then I realized, oh, you know, like you can, if you put a package JSON, in the dist folder, then Node will correctly be able to interpret what type of, of module that is. So I could have a single index.js or, or a single index.ts, build it into both locations, and just drop a, a package JSON in those folders, and Node will just know to pull it in in the right way. Cool. TypeScript 5.2 came out, and that kind of broke a bunch of stuff for me. Um, so it fixed a bunch of things and it also broke some other things. It became much more opinionated about uh, what you specify as module resolution versus what you set as module and whether it's building as common JS or as ESM. So 
they did all this to fix like the much more common bug, uh, the some common bugs and common foot guns in the much more common use case, which is you're either building common JS or ESM, not both. I would have made the same decision in the same situation, but like, wow, it was really frustrating for me because all of a sudden I had to like, all my build scripts broke. And that's when I realized just doing this all by hand was sort of not the best way forward. So I wrote Tashi. Um, what that does is it actually puts a package JSON file in your source folder, then does the TypeScript builds as ESM, then swaps that package JSON file for a different package JSON file in your source folder, does the TypeScript build for common JS, and then deletes that uh, temporary package JSON file. So it's it's doing some at this point, like it started out as like, you know, a replacement for like a four line bash script, and it's grown into like a full full on thing. But uh, uh, there's some joke in there about butts getting big or something. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm, I'm using that in a lot of places now and it has really simplified stuff um, because I just like, I just pointed at like, hey, like these are the three models I want to export. Um, another thing that I frequently kind of ran into is like the big differences between CommonJS and ESM, right? You don't, not only don't you have import.meta.url in CommonJS, if you try to check for import.meta.url, it's a syntax error. This is just like, oh God, I, I just... I want to. I want to have some words with somebody. I want somebody to make that make sense for me. That like, why is that a syntax error? Like, you can't. Anyway, but it's in the language spec now. Like, you can't use import outside of a module context. You can't even like look at import.meta. Import is can only be used as dynamic import. Like, if you try to use it in any other way, it's it's actually a bad syntax. Um, so, if you want to look at like, what is the current you know, what's the path to the current module, there's two completely different ways to do it. Because you either have to look at, you know, double underscore dir name or file name, which don't exist in ESM, or you have to look at import meta URL, which doesn't exist in common JS. And if you try to check if it exists, that's a syntax error. You can't even like try and catch it. Um, I guess you could probably try eval, like that would probably work, but I, I don't know, like just, so what I did was, um, what I started doing with, uh, uh, with no tap was when I needed to get this kind of information, I would actually just write the module twice. Like I'd write a version that uses import meta URL and a version that uses double underscore file name. And in the common JS build, I would just like move the file to overwrite the ESM one. Which like as long as you keep these kinds of like polyfills really small, you know, like literally a module that just exports import.meta.url and does nothing else or whatever. And so I know like, okay, whatever this thing is, it's gonna give me a string and I can resolve against that string and figure out what I need to figure out. Um then doing this trick where you where you clobber it is not so bad. Um and so in Tushy, I actually made like a, a convention for doing that. Uh so that you can just sort of name something dash cjs dot cts and it'll like keep it out of the ESM build. And then in the common JS build, it'll like move the file into place so that it overwrites ESM version. So yeah, that's that's that. Uh, tushy has been part of my um, follow every side quest adventure that I've been going on with NodeTap. Um, I'm, I'm eyeballs deep in like basically implementing a pseudo terminal in JavaScript. <laughs> for my documentation <laughs> right now. That is quite the side quest. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like I, I have this test framework and it outputs reports that are like styled with ANSI, um, you know, ANSI color codes and whatnot. And um, I want to put in the documentation like what it looks like because that's what people want to know, right? And I had been like dumping it to a file and then doing like a find replace in Vim or whatever to to change it into HTML and CSS. And that just got really tedious. So I, I wrote a thing to like um, automatically convert those into, into CSS and then quickly found like, oh, but wait, some of the color codes that ink actually outputs are not, or some of the ANSI codes are not just color. They're like go up three lines and go to the first column and it all comes out in one big long stream. And I'm like, oh, I need a thing that's going to parse that. And like, here I am. Oh, ANSI, ANSI to HTML will be, will be coming soon. 
There is a library. Of course, there's a there's a package. There's always a package. There, you know, I found some. I found some that could that could parse the ANSI color codes, but n- not all the cursor positioning stuff. Yeah, and if you get like a slash R in there, and it, it, or something again, that's like erased to the end of the line. Like, I need. I'm actually I'm using ink to do the output. So if what I want to be able to do, what I want is run an ink program, grab its output, like the stream of ANSI, turn that into HTML, have it look right. That's what I want. That would be really cool. I've been writing some games in ink. Uh, I've got a solitaire game that I wrote a little while back in ink, but I would love to do more of that. And testing is one of those things is like testing in docs and like rendering states and stuff would be like fun. So that'd be, that'd be really cool. I'd love that. The, the ink testing library yeah. is pretty good. That's what I, that's what I use in tap to yeah. test the reporters. Um, and the, the big, I don't know if you found this yet, but like using um, use layout effect instead of use effect is absolutely critical in ink. Like I, I had a bunch of tests that were all doing use effect and react was getting real clever about like batching and asynchronous and deferring and all my tests would just fail unless I put timeouts everywhere. So I discovered to use layout effect. It was just like, oh, that's what I needed. Okay, so uh, we went a little over on time. <laughs> so uh, we probably weren't, we're not going to do tooltips this week. Uh, I just want to thank you for coming on. Uh, this was uh, a great conversation. Like, honestly, a little starstruck uh, being here with somebody I've known about in the JavaScript space for so long. So just thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Isaac, this was... This was such a like a deep, enriching conversation. I love to hear about the history of, of NPM, of course, and your experiences of that. And also just, you know, how you think a lot about a lot of these things and how the sort of ecosystem has evolved and everything. So awesome conversation. Really just super excited to have you on. Cool. 